This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So before we introduce the terrific guest we had today, I must apologize to people here rumbling in the background. Just as we were about to start recording this, my neighbor is having a big outdoor contracting job going on. They're putting in a new patio. So they started compacting all the dirt. So literally 15 feet from my desk here, there's a guy with this massive compactor. So it's just rumbling here. So if you hear a rumbling, that's what it is. I couldn't hear it. So let's hope. Anyways, we had a great conversation. Victor Riccardi joined us today. And uh, he's the visiting assistant professor of finance at Washington and Lee University. And we reached him, I, I believe at his home in West Virginia. Fascinating guy, fascinating topic. We could have talked for a long time. He's the coordinator of behavioral and experimental research at the Social Science Research Network. And he's the editor for seven SSRN e-journal topics in the area of behavioral finance, financial history, accounting history, and decision-making under risk and uncertainty. And he also has an MBA in finance and an advanced professional certificate in economics from St. John's University, and also holds graduate certificates in personal financial planning and financial therapy from Kansas State University. And he also co-authored a book with H. Kent Baker in 2014 called Investor Behavior, the Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing. Uh, as I mentioned in the interview, I've been connected to, to Victor for years and we've you know chatted back and forth a little bit, but I've never met him before, neither had you. Um, but he was great, very personable, lots of interesting answers and very thought-provoking answers, I thought. No, oh, he's clearly spent a lot of time thinking and researching the, the topics that we discussed. So yeah, I think he was well, well qualified for the type of discussion that we had with him. Anything else to add? No, let's go to the conversation with Victor. All right, enjoy the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Victor Riccardi, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's terrific to have you. We've been connected on LinkedIn for a long time, so it's super to finally meet you in person. So to kick it off, can you tell us how far back do the first documented studies of investor behavior go? Um, well, I'm not sure about it. I mean, in terms of what you want to classify as investor behavior, but I remember uh, Selden has a uh, book called The Psychology of um, Stock of the Stock Markets or Stock Market Psychology. That goes back to the early 1900s. So there are all, all types of, at least I would say more qualitative um, uh, type of, if you, I wouldn't call them studies, but there's a lot of readings that really talk about behavior on the markets. If you're talking about more of an academic, I mean, academic or standard finance or the rational school didn't even really start until the 1960s. Um, schools of business or departments of finance in academia really didn't start until the 19, 1970s. So if you're even just talking about quality academic research in finance, you're only talking about really 50 years, 60 years of knowledge. Interesting. So it's more like documented anecdotal accounts of what m might have seemed like um, investor psychology, but it wasn't a real academic study until more recently. Exactly. Because and again, you know, you started off with again when I when I was discussing the standard uh, school, I'm talking about things like efficient markets, rational decision making, um, more modern portfolio theory, but. You know, the many of the earlier work, as I said, is just very qualitative nations, storytelling, you know, people looking at crashes, you know, looking at some data, but really not formalizing until psychology, uh, because a lot of what comes from behavioral finance comes from uh, psychological experiments done in the 1970s and 1980s, especially by uh, Paul Slovic, um, Amos Tversky, and um, Danny Kahneman. Yeah, that's the most interesting thing I find about behavioral finance is that there there, there was no testable hypothesis until psychology uh, was able to start testing things. And now that's caught up with finance. Well, I mean, uh, and I've said this before in other places, um, standard finance or academic finance really su suffers from a status quo bias, meaning they have an inertia of the, the rational school. And 
And, and I am actually a big fan in some ways of, of rational thinking, rational investment strategies. I just don't agree with the necessarily the underlying assumptions. Sure, which which makes sense. So that, that that leads to an interesting question. Do, do you think that investors should aim to make rational decisions? And, and yes. And, and what I think behavioral finance does is um, actually understanding what your biases are. Are you overconfident? Do you trade too much? Are you a warrior? Do you feel stress? What are your trigger points when you invest money, when you spend money? And so if you're actually sitting down with a financial advisor or a planner, hopefully they help you develop a non-emotional strategy, things that you're comfortable with. And when the market has a massive correction, if you're in the proper risk profile, if you also have an idea, even within the financial planning context, of saying, I'm 80% towards my goal, the market came back a little bit, let me, let me keep on that path to reaching my financial goal and my financial plan. Interesting. So we, we know humans are, are not rational, pretty much for, for a fact, I guess I would say. Um, well, it's not that we're totally irrational. We're right. people are, as Mayor Stockman says, um, to coin, give him credit, it's people are normal. Yeah. So we have emotions. <laughs> we sometimes make um, bad decisions, but not necessarily the worst decisions. And this is essentially what's known as bounded rationality. Our past experiences, our emotions, our values, our religious belief, our gender, our family history, and so on, influence the decisions we make every day. And so even though we're not jumping off of bridges when we make bad decisions, we are essentially, we're sufficing. So if we have a choice of five uh, options, maybe we choose the second one. It wasn't the best one, but maybe we're satisfied with it over time. Can you can you go back and, and maybe just uh, give, give a little bit more of an explanation of that term, bounded rationality that you use? Because I think that's very important. Uh, yeah, so it's essentially it's related to the notion of sufficing, which is, as I was alluding to, where we don't all, ra uh, rational school would say we optimize every decision. We make the best decision. Well, we can also make satisfactory decisions that we're still happy about because we are presented with so many different options, even just doing an online search on the internet, think about all the different th factors that we should be considering. So having a past history in some ways works, but it, no matter what, it's still going to influence our overall decision making. Yeah, that's fascinating. So it's almost like we, we can we can aim to make rational decisions, but also understand that not making not making the rational choice is okay if it suffices for other reasons. Yes, I mean again, um, you know, I mean uh, even just with an investment portfolio, if if. Yeah, the rational thing would be to optimize a million dollar portfolio, but I wind up having at retirement eight hundred thousand dollars. I still have to run pretty well, so that's I'm satisfied with the eight hundred thousand compared. And then if you if you drew it as a sample against other people who don't have you know how much the American public don't have enough save or the, around the world people don't have enough for retirement, you're doing better than you know, probably twenty percent or 10% of the overall population of any particular country. So, so let's link this concept of rationality with the market. So if we agree that people are irrational, does it follow or does it make sense that a hypothetically rational investor should be able to persistently beat the market by exploiting the irrational investors? If they're, tr if they're able to consistently act rational. I mean, you know, you may have a time period where you have this rational strategy. You think you're being rational, but you still may be influenced by some uh, other biases that you're not even aware of. Uh, again, the human mind is very tricky. So, you know, you can be described, I, I guess the way to think about it is, you know, you may think you know, uh, so something like overconfidence is maybe measurable, you think you suffer from it, and you got over it. Well, maybe there are other biases that you have that you never recognize, and that are more subliminal in your mind, and those play a factor. So, for example, it, it, the balancing of watching financial news can impact your subliminal mind. So, so if you see a negative story, that may put you in a negative mood, you may not recognize it, 
or maybe you then maybe you don't make a decision about a stock. Maybe you pay too much money for the stock because because the emotion that you're feeling from an outside source may actually affect your risk, your your uh, propensity to take risk. But then it's also going to affect your final decision to buy a security. So I guess you kind of have to lock yourself in. You ever see a Seinfeld episode where you have the bubble boy? I guess you got to live in a bubble sometimes and shut out all the noise. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it makes me think about, you know, making decisions to invest in a group. And are there, is that what you need to ensure you stay rational? You need other people to check your, your, your weaknesses, your biases before decisions are made? Oh, and well, it depends on that group. If the group is just a bunch of people who are informally getting together and they're going to have herd behavior because they heard about an internet stock in the late 1990s, well, that, that's not a group, good group decision. If it's a formal, more of a formal, say, um, and, uh, a board of trustees, a, an endowment committee for a university, and everybody has the same thought process, or, and I've been on these type of committees myself, or is, is every, or everybody has a leader that's dominant in the group, then, every, then that's going to be group think. So I think if you're aware of some biases like group think can potentially come about, uh, whether it's an investment uh, team or a research team for a portfolio, I, I always try to play the role of devil's advocate and I try to play the contrarian. It gets me in trouble sometimes, but actually putting that uh, in some of my consulting work, I try to tell people that you should even maybe develop a little bit of a questionnaire in that format to make sure that people are not suffering from group think, but as well have one or two people on your team who is going to play, why are we investing in this mutual fund? Everybody agrees. Well, why not just have somebody, one or two people also say, what are the disadvantages of investing in this particular fund or fund category right now? Because that way you then you get rid of or you hopefully nullify the group think process as much. So interesting. So interesting. Yeah, and it also makes me think about in, investing in groups or or uh, investing with agency issues involved. Also makes me think of uh, limits to arbitrage, which can be another reason that even a rational investor can't exploit other irrational investors if they have uh, like a, the board of trustees. Uh, questioning them about the value stocks, for example, right now are underperforming. Even if we think there is a positive value premium, doesn't mean you can capture it. Exactly. Uh, heuristics are, for, for our listeners, r rules of thumb or mental models uh, that people use to make decisions quickly. Do you think that heuristics are net, on average, helpful or harmful to investors? Um. I think many times they're harmful, but they can be helpful to a degree. So uh, heuristics are essentially rules of thumb, and they're also a, a cognitive process. So, so again, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the, the behavioral bias known as representativeness is when people draw conclusions about a small sample of information. So if, um, if you invest in an IPO and... That first IPO, you make a lot of money, you then draw the conclusion that all IPOs are good investments going forward. Versus a, a, a negative experience like um, somebody being sold a, an annuity product and getting a very low return and having high fees, they realize later, then they will cancel out and never say, I, I never want to invest in a annuity again. No, another example is what's known as anchoring. And this is uh, detrimental because people anchor, say, on the financial crisis, say they anchor on the, when the pandemic started this, this year, and they lost a lot of money, and they pulled out of the market, and they never get back in because they're kind of, as I, as I described before, they're you know, paralyzed or suffering from inertia, and they can't change their behavior because of that anchor. And what's even worse is even when they're able to lift the anchor, correct their behavior, the anchor has a more likelihood of reappearing. So interesting. So you alluded to this earlier, but can you elaborate on the role that our subconscious mind plays in making financial decisions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so what I was alluding to was a, 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 uh, talking about a navigating experience. Well, there are so psychological experiments that, sh that compare 
um, a control group that didn't see a story and then another laboratory experiment that shows a negative story. And then those people, they're, they didn't, they're not even aware of it. And then they're, they're then asked to buy or purchase something. And in some cases, the people who saw the negative story compared to the other, other group that didn't wind up paying you know, two to four times more for, say, a mug or a cup. So if that's a stock, that's a problem. If that's a car, if that's a, a going grocery shopping. So, you know, there's a line of thinking related to that is that, you know, depending on your mood influences your risk taking. So if subconsciously you become in a negative mood, you may take more risk, not realize that above your typical risk profile, and they make the riskier decisions that you would necessarily have made. Is another way to frame it around that. Wow, is that the same concept as risk perception, which is something that I've written, uh, I've read in your writing? Um, it's close to that. I mean, it's 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 really recognizing. I mean, so risk tolerance is the maximum amount of risky assets you'll take in your portfolio, so, such as stocks. Risk perception is more of a driven by feelings and our perception in the future or how we previously felt something. So in a way, sometimes risk perception or high degrees of worry, high degrees of stress can actually change our risk tolerance maybe over time. Interesting. And is it, so is it risk perception or risk tolerance or is it both that, that can be affected by our subconscious mind? Um, I'm get, I, I would say both, but there's really not much resource to improve that. I'm just saying, you know, thinking about the, um, the, the other types of concepts and then kind of pulling out the risk piece is what I'm kind of doing. Right. Can you, can you, and this is, I don't know if you'd be able to answer this, this is a tough one. I don't think anybody has the answer. Why do you think that sophisticated and unsophisticated investors continue to invest in high fee actively managed funds despite all the evidence showing that they're probably not the best investments? Well, again, we are attracted by the shiny red apple. It's like, why did everybody invest in growth, growth stocks? We uh, like true. the things that feel good. Also, I mean, it's sometimes hard to, to um, you know, I, I think of 401k plans where is it always a question of rationality? Um, if you want to sometimes get a, a diversified portfolio, and say part of a four hundred one k plan, even talking about a morning, the morning, uh, the morning star box, sometimes you have, and it may not mean that you want to call them completely highly active, but if you don't want to invest, if you want to have a diversified portfolio, and and I, I'm not comfortable with just putting all my money in S and P five hundred, so. If I want to say, if I want to go with six, the six morning star categories, you know, large cap, mid cap, and small cap, and then value and growth, and then a couple of international funds. If you're talking about money in a 401k plan, which typically are very highly regulated, and that's really only a choice on your menu, I'm going to select some actively managed funds as a trade off to. Maybe wanting some exposure on val on the value side, so that that's that could be my decision about is it a rational? Yes, but is that a, a way of thinking about sufficing and bounding rationality? I'm making a trade off of diver on diversification. So the rational part is to be diversified. The sufficing portion is to try to balance between the active, the passive, and the different asset classes and, and value and growth. That's another way to think about it. So follow on to that. Is there a difference in terms of why investors invest in active funds versus why advisors recommend active funds? Is there a difference between those reasonings? Well, I, I mean, it also depends on if there's a conflict of interest. How is that advisor compensated? So, and, and again, I, I think also what is the track record of success with the advisor? The, the bias could be that they could be suffering from representativeness. They have a certain group of active funds that they made a lot of money for their clients. So they're going to draw a conclusion from that example that could be re representativeness. Um, also, there can be a degree of overconfidence. 
Uh, and they also, advisors can also use heuristics when they're recommending um, recommendations. So again, if you, you know, you're talking about macro risk tolerance, although it's a little bit off the question, but you know, if you think of people who are you know, gender biased, so typically men are thought to be more aggressive uh, risk takers than women. Well, if you're a man, if, for example, if you're a male advisor and you automatically put, put a woman into the less risky category, well, that's, that's how they may use heuristics. So advisors have to be very careful of these same issues I'm discussing. I think your, your, your point about representative, representativeness bias for advisors is fascinating because if you think about the distribution of outcomes, there's always going to be a cohort of active advisors who have had great outcomes for their clients. And they're going to keep recommending active funds. Of course they are. Exactly. It's fascinating to think about. How important is the way that information is framed to the decision-making process? It is extremely important. Um, especially for, for meeting your financial goals, positive frames are extremely important. But also, it's so, so typically I, I think about the annuity puzzle in which people typically don't like annuities. Mm -hmm. So if you try to sell somebody an annuity and you tell them this, this investment is going to pay you $2,000 a month in retirement and in income, a 25-year-old is going to look at you like you're crazy. And so maybe, a, maybe a, a low percentage of people will take the investment. But if you actually build a relationship and find that in at age – 65, the person wants to travel around the world, take vacations, play golf, and you, you frame the discussion around the income is going to be used for your spending activity, they're more likely to accept the investment. And, and actually doing that's a nice way of reaching your financial goal, but also to kind of step back further, we tend to be primed. So the section of our brain about sex, drugs, and rock and roll also affects money. So we also are inclined, because our chemicals in our brain, to be spenders. We have impulses to spend money, and that's at a trade-off of not reaching our financial goals. So actually delaying the consumption in today's dollars and putting the money for retirement, the consumption piece then relates in the future to the spending activity of income, and then you have money to spend in the future, and you'll have more money from, from investing as well. So you have a higher standard of living because you're saving more money towards the future, but you're spending less money today, but then you can spend more money in the future. So do you think... I mean, given bounded rationality like we've been talking about, do you think that me mental accounting, which is often positioned as a, as a flaw in thinking, do you think that there's a, a place where mental accounting can be useful in financial planning? Yes. So, so mental, mental accounting, and, and this is uh, coming on the application side, does have that because you, you can think about mental accounting as creating buckets. So credit card debt is bad, also framing it as a mental account. So you want to pay that off. Long-term assets in retirement is for money until at least eight, after age 59 and a half in an IRA or 401k plan, and you don't want to touch that or dip into that because then also you're going to have the tax um, consequences of that. Um, and, and, and so that those mental, or even myself, I use it. So 95% of my wealth is in my 401k or my 403b plan, so... Maybe I actively make adjustments to mutual funds a little bit, uh, you know, more like asset, more like rebalancing. But then I have my IRA account in which I have my play money. So if I can't go to the trough during the pandemic, I, <laughs> I have 1% to 3% of my overall wealth just to get over my gambling urges and I trade a couple stocks here and there. But it will not affect my wealth. And so that's how to control that gambling and sticking me. That's a good example of buckets. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we we on, on, on our podcast here often talk about the five-factor model for asset pricing, the Fama French five-factor model. 
uh, and, and how that relates to portfolio construction. But there's also, and I got this from reading your book, there's a, a, a five-factor model for personality. And that includes extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness to intellect. And that model, based on your book, is, is rooted in biology. So there are d- pr- genetic predispositions for those traits, which I've, is fascinating to think about. How, how important is it, and I, you mentioned this earlier on in our conversation, um, but if you can elaborate, how, how important is it for investors to understand their own five-factor model, their, their own f- factor exposure for their personality? How, how important is it to understand that in order to be a good investor? Well, and, and also it's very important because it also relates to risk decision-making. Um, the, in terms of the research, I would say the two most dominant research results are people who are extroverts and people who are neurotic. And so if, if you tend to be outgoing, you may be a little bit of a, more, more of a risk taker, but you balance that off with hope you're, hopefully you're a little bit rational and you're not taking excessive decisions. I think it, the problem is when you're a very outgoing extrovert and you're highly neurotic, because then you're, you're combining an, an emotional state, higher emotional state with po- possibly negative feelings. And, and in the wor- the in the worst case scenario, in my second book, there's actually a, a, a discussion of um, psycho, psycho uh, financial psychopaths. So, about one in two hundred people in the population in general have some psychotic or episodes, or have some trace of that. And I and I, and I bet Wall Street tends to attract a greater percentage of them because. Of the because what they like money and and fame and and managing money control builds up your ego, so uh, that that's really on the extreme though. Um, and then the other uh, the uh, so hmm. if you're trying to manage or if you're coming from the idea that you're a financial advisor, being able to deal with different t- types of personalities, you know, if someone's just outgoing and and uh, an extrovert. You may be able to have that conversation. They'll listen to some of your financial advice. Somebody who is highly neurotic is probably very overconfident and also controlling and also less trusting. So then those people are typically if on the extreme or not going to be willing to listen to your financial advice. So I think it's also a decision about how much energy are those people. You know, sometimes you can't save everybody. And so you really have to think about how you want to deal with those clients. On the other side, people who are very open and agreeable to new ideas may accept every idea. So you don't want a Bernie Madoff situation. You don't want people investing in things and they don't understand. They don't assess the risk. So that's kind of where the personality is a, a good in terms of risk-taking, people who are willing to invest in certain products, people who are manageable, Having a balance of, of conversations and, and letting really getting to know your client and yourself as an investor really does matter on your personality. So, do you, do you think it would be wise for individual investors to do some sort of personality test so that they can moderate their biases better? Yeah, and I, I, but I would also take it with a grain of salt. It shouldn't be. It, it should be also understanding what risk type, type of risk taker you are. Reflecting on, and again, if you really get into something like financial therapy or financial coaching, it's also maybe keeping a journal. And I, and I know that sometimes sounds corny, but even it doesn't have to be a journal. But keeping a tra- reflecting on the track record of investment decisions that you've made, even from the stock market, and keeping a log when you made good decisions, how you were feeling, what was your state of mind, were, were you watching a financial network where you listen to, you know, was was the room quiet? All the, you know, what environment are you able to make the best decisions as an individual? I think it's important to think about too. And should inv- individuals also look for these traits in their sources of advice, be it in the media or with their advisor? Like, is there some way to watch out for these different characteristics in your advisor? Or I'm even thinking like in the media, for example, like, are people in the media more extroverted, for example? I would say that. Would, I think it's a filtering process, but it shouldn't be the sole trait that you're looking at. If, if I think the, the gut feeling is, is the extra, is it, so outgoing that their behavior is over the top. And I, and I think it's also just who we feel comfortable 
as as well. I mean, um, if if the if you're not comfortable with the financial advice that the advisor is giving you, and they keep on pushing it down your throat like a heart, like a sales, like you buy a car and it feels like a yeah a a hard, like a um, impactful or intimidating sales pitch, whether it's a personality or not. That's when you have the power to get up and leave. So I think it's and and the thing though is even you know we have to consider that for some people it's a the other problem is there's a social component. People some feel sometimes feel obligated to take financial advice because just because the advisor sat down with them, buy a car because there's a cycle out because they gave their time. Um, especially uh, if you look at the difference between negotiating styles between men and women, I always t- t- encourage my female students to realize that they should, nothing wrong with asking for more. It's nothing wrong with negotiating hard. So, you know, there has to be also, there's a gender issue there as well. So I think a lot of times it's, I try to put myself in sales situations where it's not a, a high impact thing. So if I'm buying a car, I try to at least get a quote online before going in and talking to the salesperson because I don't feel comfortable with that type of stuff as well. Got it. So there's an emerging profession in financial therapy. Can you describe what financial therapy is and how do you think it can benefit investors? Well, and, and so I think I'm going to the two buckets. The, the first would be if you're a financial advisor and you're dealing with somebody who's suffering from overconfidence. And that can be just asking them a question about stock returns. And if they always explicitly say they're going to be above average, that could be the lead up to the suffering from overconfident behavior. And then you notice in their account that they are trading too much. So that, that's probably a, an issue of overconfident behavior. If you, if through a conversation of coaching, which would be maybe talking about financial literacy, educating the, the client and then talking about a financial plan. If they stick with that, then, then, and they're not, they stop trading a lot. They, it seems like their, their behavior has subsided. Then that, that's a, that, that's a coaching pro- component. The therapy component would be somebody who you're doing that same thing with as an advisor, but they constantly don't listen to you or they can't help themselves. So somebody trading too much might have a history of a family traumatic experience, or maybe they have some, so think about somebody, and this comes out of the research dealing with hoarders, but also somebody who's a compulsive gambler who is trading in the market too much is probably outside the realm of that, that financial advisor. So there's a, a field now that started since the financial crisis that people who are a- experts in money behavior who are classically trained as financial therapists. And there's actually, they've actually just rolled out some credentials on it. Uh, and so it's very interesting in that you can actually become a financial therapist. But I only know of a couple firms that actually will refer a financial therapist. So it, it is a very unique stages of a beginning field, but it's also a great career opportunity rather than a student just getting an undergraduate degree in psychology. If they take some financial planning classes and then they get a, have a degree in psychology, they can then become a money therapist. And so rather than charge somebody $200 an hour, you can charge someone $1,000 an hour. <laughs> so it's, it's really who you are and who your clientele with. So, it's, it's a, it's very, so that's what financial therapy is. It's really dealing with a much deeper psychological framing and it deals with flashpoints. So in life, Early in our relationship, those money flashpoints help us to to develop into our adulthood money beliefs. And at most extreme, those money beliefs become money disorders like hoarding, um, as I said, compulsive gambling. And there's a list of about six, seven of them that really affect people's behavior. But that's on the extreme. There was a section in your book that talked about the relationship between money and 
happiness. And there, there was a really interesting discussion on whether money results in happiness or happiness results in money. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Well, even what I tell my students is um, the way I think, I frame it around. The point is not to make a certain amount of money, but building wealth gives you options. And if you have options, that leads to happiness. So yeah, making money for the sake of money to me is just doesn't bring happiness. But even, yeah, even there was just anecdotal study that around $75,000 kind of makes people happy or they have some degree of level of satisfaction and happiness. Um, so, cause I don't know what the current IRS data is, but I, I, I think that there's only something about 20% of married couples make about, if you look at IRS data, and I'm not sure what the current is, but about only about 20% of the American people who are, who are married couples make above a hundred thousand dollars each. Single people who are who make above six figures are only about five six percent of the population. So there's this big conglomerate of people making between thirty to what seventy five thousand or eighty thousand dollars, which is most people in most American families. Uh, so yeah, I, I think happiness and money is also if you don't li- if you live below your means. You learn to save money, understand the time value of money, understand what you want out of life, have those discussions of what's important to you, then that leads to happiness. For, for me personally, I, 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 I love being a professor. So, so I have sacrificed other, other things in my life because I started my career off as an accountant and I enjoyed the experience for a few years, but going every day and working 60, 70 hours a week was, doing accounting was not my thing. If I work a lot of hours now during the semester, I'm doing it, but I enjoy it. So I think the money is an important thing, but what is one of the things that you enjoy, your family, your career, and money is part of the equation. So many of our listeners are managing either their own money or their family's money. So some practical advice I'm looking for from you. So other than them working with a professional, what can do-it-yourself investors do to check their own biases? Well, I, I would say don't look at your portfolio too much. I mean, it's, a, it's balancing out between how much money you, how, how often you want to check it. Um, limit the, and again, you want to educate yourself. So I'm not saying not to read about things, but, you know, how much of financial news, how much internet action about financial news can you take in a, in a week? Uh, Again, even in that regard, if you keep a little bit of a journal, are you having mood screens? If you're taking five hours of uh, financial news during the day, is that affecting your mood versus if you're it's just an hour or two? So it's, it's kind of finding your routine. Um, additionally, I think stupid and simple is sometimes a better way to do things. Actually not overthinking things. Uh, I started investing in the market when I was 12 years old. And in some ways, if I would have just kept the stocks I had and didn't sell stuff, didn't trade stuff in my, in the, during the internet bubble, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have more money now, from that just what, than what I'm saving now as a professor. So I think sometimes just sticking with the basics, constantly educating yourself, staying away from the new thing of the moment, having a diversified portfolio, rebalancing, and I think even just um, reading some behavioral research, reading some books, now, it doesn't have any mind. There are many, many wonderful books on behavioral finance now. It's just constantly educating yourself to, to realize how comfortable you are with investing money and not making bad decisions as well, understand. And learning from your past mistakes is very important. I, I loved your earlier comment about the, the decision journal. I think that that's something everybody should do. Uh, in in financial advisor client relationships, trust is huge. Uh, of, of course, I think people understand why. Um, but there are a lot of situations, and in Canada, I, I think we see this a lot, just because of the uh, conflicts of interest with the embedded commissions and mutual funds that we we still have a lot of here. Um, what do you think non experts can do 
even if they're in a trusting relationship with their financial advisor, or maybe one of our listeners has a, a parent or something that has a, a financial advisor that's selling them uh, these commission-based products, what, what can a non-expert do to check if they're getting good advice, even if they trust the person that the advice is coming from? Well, and, and there tends to be a balance. Part of the equation is trust and control. So um, if you're too trusting in your advisor, and you take and you take no control, and you have a lack of control, or don't, don't take really any responsibility for your investments. That's when you're going to have, you know, Ponzi schemes. You're going to make bad decisions. On the other hand, um, if you're excessively controlling, neurotic, uh, and um, overconfident about your decisions, and you're you're too controlling and a lack, have a lack of trust in that financial advice or that financial advisor, you're not going to have any meaningful relationship with that person. So that's really for the advisor and the client, it's really finding that middle ground. And I, and I also realize, um, and, and another thing is that people don't typically do this, but there, there are advisors that specialize, for example, just checking the advice that somebody else gives you. And so if somebody is sitting down with a financial advisor, they're giving you a financial plan, but you don't want to transfer your money. There are our, there, there are personal financial planners. I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., you can pay on them on an hourly basis. And they, you don't have to invest any money with them. But every once in a while, maybe every couple of years, just check, have them review the portfolio. They're an outside source. Make sure they don't know that other person or have any affiliations with them. And then you're, doing, you're making sure the advice that you're receiving is adequate. Same way you would go to a doctor and get a, get a second opinion, you're essentially getting a second opinion on your, on your portfolio. And especially as you start to accumulate a good deal of wealth, I think that's very important. Hmm. Going back to the biases, and I'm thinking about all the information that's basically everywhere on the internet, the free financial advice that we all have access to. Do you think all that access has been helpful or harmful to investors? And I'm thinking about like the biases that it might uh, exacerbate. And, and this is where I, I think you have to be careful because some free advice is probably fine or free, free run work. But what people don't distinguish from, even, even like the two books I've done, Investor Behavior and Financial Behavior, my colleagues and I, in terms of the people that wrote them, the people that the editing that we spent, we're talking about thousands of hours. So it's not a rational decision. It's a labor of love. But it's creating a quality document. Information that is simply available on certain, like Wikipedia, is not necessarily vetted. Other information that's coming from a brokerage house may be free or investment advisor may be free, but they may be doing it to get your business. So I think it's really thinking about the back to the issue of trust. Is that information, whether it's free or not, coming from a trusted source? Are there conflicts of instant interests? So I think that's a bigger part of the question. But also the problem is there is so much information, and that's why you go back to using heuristics because you're suffering from all the information overload. So it's, it's trying to Figure out, I think it's really, think about creating a top five list of the places that you think are the, mo are the most helpful and use those as your main source of finding information. Makes sense. In Canada right now, and this kind of ties back to, we, we briefly talked about asset pricing and all, all these biases. We right now have some of the most expensive real estate markets in the world um, relative to fundamentals like wages and rents. Does the behavioral finance literature suggest that there's a relationship between the behavioral biases we've been talking in application to stock markets? Does that also apply to real estate markets? Uh, yes. I mean, so just to give you a couple of examples, um, especially I mentioned earlier the anchoring bias. Yeah. Somebody who, who paid, um, say, uh, $200,000 for something previously and then they hear the value current value of it a year ago was 450,000 however they go to sell that asset and now they're getting quoted only 400,000 
Well, they feel like that four hundred thousand is a loss because they could, if they sold a year ago, they could have gotten four fifty. So that's an anchoring piece. So that prevents people from actually just selling the asset. Um, other issues are, if you've seen with bubbles in real estate, the same things repeat themselves. The herd mentality. Um, I remember seeing uh, there's videos, um, especially during the financial crisis of 2008. Before that, they have these um, videos in which people are jumping up and down, cheering, because they're learning to sell and buy real estate at these seminars. So that... Back to that group think, salesmanship, bad, bad sales practices uh, lead to that. And, and then even um, certain cultures, um, I think that I'm trying to think, it, I think the number eight in the Asian culture impacts, is, or it's a lucky number. So in, in certain instances, people intentionally put the number eight in the, in, in, the, in the price of the real estate because it, co- it shows it causes people that, well, like the address or the price, to have an A in it and then, or the eighth floor or something or maybe the 28th floor, that it causes them that are more likely to buy that real estate. So that, that just gives you a, a sample of different types of, and, and many of the biases that are related to stocks can also be applied to some of the real estate products as well. So you have an incredible body of work in this field, obviously, and you've also talked about your decision to leave accounting and go into the field of being a professor. Can you talk about how you define success in your life? Um, The greatest success in my life, at least on a professional level, is when I see students who are learning, they get jobs that you never thought they would get. They are successful. Um, I mean, for for me, educating my students and seeing that over, over their lifetime that they maybe a little bit of what I taught them makes a difference and impacts them into the future. Choosing, realizing if they never had me as a finance professor taking a personal finance class with me, they may have never gone to finance. And so to me, that's the wonderful of success, knowing that they're finding, that, knowing they're finding their success is my success and knowing that they're finding happiness because of me actually brings me a great deal of happiness outside of my family, outside of my friends and other relationships I have. For me, that's happiness. And being able to teach and talk about money, uh, never wanted to manage money, but Hoping even in, in the constant and in, and in the road, I discovered this wonderful field called, towards, toward, called behavioral finance. And if, it, if doing these type of appearances help even people in any way learn about finance in general and, and increases financial literacy, I've done my job. So when God says to me, what did you do? That's going to be my answer. I taught people to buy low, sell high. <laughs> Well, you did your job here today, Vic. Uh, You had an impact certainly on our listeners and on Ben and I. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a a great, great time. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.